Well, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to day two of our conference. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Richard Maud. I'm the director of this year's Crawford Forum. Thank you very much for joining us again today. Um, I want to begin, uh, as is customary, by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands the university sits, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I extend those respects uh, to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. Now, very shortly, we're going to move to our uh, day two plenary session on whether or not we can find uh, a model of coexistence with China. It's hard to imagine a more pressing or more urgent foreign policy challenge uh, for any nation at the moment, and certainly it's one that dominates the policy discussion in Canberra. And China's already loomed very large in our conference. We had a strong, very firm speech by the Treasurer yesterday on standing firm against economic coercion from China. Notable, I think, for its very clear call to the business community that it needed to understand and adapt to changing geopolitical circumstances, recognise the increasing risk of over-dependency on China as a market, and adopt what the Treasurer called a China plus approach to our economic links with Australia's largest trading partner. Uh, and then last night, uh, the Indian Foreign Minister, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, gave a terrific address, the J.G. Crawford oration. If you haven't had a chance to catch up with that speech, you can find it on ANU TV, the uh, university's YouTube channel. It's a very thoughtful speech, as you'd expect from Dr. Jai Shankar, and I encourage you to have a look at it. Um, amongst other things he said, and I'm, I'm quoting here from Dr. Jai Shankar's speech about the impact of China, he said, let's be clear, this is not just about the rise of another power, however major. We've entered a new phase of international relations and the full impact of China's re-emergence will be felt more than those of major powers. So today we have an excellent uh, panel to grapple with. I'm very grateful uh, in particular to our international guests. It's still early in Japan. Um, it's shockingly early in Jakarta. So thank you, Dino, for getting up uh, literally at the crack of dawn. And it's getting late in Washington. And I'm very grateful that uh, my friend and former colleague, Justin Hayhurst from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is also with us today. After the China panel, please do stay with us for concurrent sessions on the future of multilateralism and also on technological competition and whether or not it means that the world of tech globalization is over, at least for now. And then finally, if you're not all completely zoomed out by then, please do join us for the short closing session where the Vice Chancellor Brian Schmidt and Heather Smith and I will chew over the conference, uh, the day and a half of the conference and offer a few takeouts of what we heard. Now, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Louisa Lim, who's very kindly agreed to moderate this panel discussion. Over to you, Louisa. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you for that fantastic briefing paper that you wrote that forms the starting point for our discussion. Um, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where I join you today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Uh, welcome any members of the media that have joined us today. And to remind you that if you'd like to join the discussion on Twitter, please use the hashtag, hashtag ACL Forum. Today, we're so lucky to have this panel of very distinguished speakers. Um, please welcome me and join me in welcoming the speakers. First, Michelle Flournoy, co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. Michelle served as the US Undersecretary of Defense for Policy under President Barack Obama. We're also delighted to welcome Dino Jalal, the founder of the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. He's a former Indonesian ambassador to the US and a former deputy foreign minister. Um, we also are joined by Justin Hayhurst, Deputy Secretary of the Indo-Pacific Group at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And our final speaker is Akiko Fukushima, Senior Fellow for the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research, who served on many Japanese government committees. So this panel is examining that most central of questions, which is being asked in capitals all around the world, how to coexist with China. The headlines from China these days seem to hop back to another era. We're seeing the introduction of Xi Jinping thought textbooks in schools, even in kindergartens, 
exhortations to promote revolutionary culture, new regulations requiring foreign vessels to report whenever they enter what Beijing sees as its territorial waters. The political ground seemed to be shifting in China with ideology being the uppermost priority. At the same time, its assertive diplomacy is driving what Richard wrote in his great briefing paper described as one of the most profound shifts in the global order since the close of World War II. And we've seen this shift most poignantly illustrated by that hurried US exit from Afghanistan. As China's state-run news agency Xinhua put it, the last dusk of empire. And at the same time, China is signaling loudly just how eager it is to step into that void. And Michelle, let's start with you. How much do you think the US withdrawal from Afghanistan has accelerated that shift in the global order? First of all, great to be with you. Thank you so much for hosting this uh, great conference. You know, so the withdrawal from Afghanistan, you know, whether you agreed with the decision that President Biden made or not, I think everyone can acknowledge that um, the execution of the withdrawal, you know, left something to be desired. It did not go as well as planned. You know, on the one hand, over 120,000 people were evacuated by air, which is a feat that probably no other military in the world could accomplish in just a few weeks. But the level of chaos, um, the, the loss of life that occurred, um, and those that have been left behind and that we're still working to evacuate, I think all of those things pointed to a withdrawal that could have been planned and executed better. And oh, by the way, it has very much um, affected some of our allied relationships, some of our NATO allies. We've always had this principle of into operations together, out of operations together. Um, our allies like Australia, like NATO, didn't feel as consulted as they wanted to be. And it's ironic because this is a president that came into office with very strong foreign policy credentials, you know, seen as a real expert with a team around him who's seen as hyper competent at execution. So I think this has taken people aback and that will take some time to recover from in some of our allied relationships. On the other hand, this withdrawal does free up bandwidth and resources and attention from the United States to really execute the rebalance to Asia and to focus more fully on the most important region in terms of American prosperity and security. And so it, it frees up bandwidth to you know, focus on recovering from COVID, getting the economy moving again, shoring up our alliances and partnerships like the, you know, our partnerships like the Quad, um, showing up in the region and so forth, and really setting the table to be more effective both in competing with China where we have to, you know, economically, technologically in some security domains, but also seeking to try to find a way to cooperate in key areas like climate change, pandemic prevention and, and so forth. So I do think that you will see the administration focusing even more on the Indo-Pacific showing up even more and seeking to regain its footing after this rocky period of withdrawal from Afghanistan. Akiko, to turn to you, I mean, how is, are these developments being viewed from Japan? I've seen commentaries worrying about Washington's withdrawal, saying it's bad news for those like Japan who rely on US security commitments. But at the same time, others saying that perhaps uh, China will lean on Japan more well, um, in, in the new sort of reality. How does you think, how does that new reality look from Tokyo? Um, thank you for the question. And I should thank you for uh, inviting me to join uh, this discussion. On your question, uh, some did uh, uh, say, uh, along the lines you have uh, quoted about uh, uh, U.S. Uh, withdrawal from uh, Kabul, uh, referring to a possible uh, ramifications on U.S. allies, including Japan. But I would argue that that was quite uh, uh, minor and majority of experts are more concerned how we can coordinate and manage uh, this turn of events in Afghanistan. As you know, uh, since uh, two decades ago, Japan has been assisting 
uh, Afghanistan in terms of uh, their development and uh, nation building. Uh, Madame Ogata has spent uh, her uh, last leg of uh, international activities in assisting uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we have many Japanese NGOs trying to help Afghan people to recover. And therefore, Foreign Minister Motegi has mentioned that Japan will coordinate with the US and other uh, like-minded countries to find out how we can better assist Afghanistan for peace and stability. There are sad news coming from my friends in Afghanistan. I was involved in uh, developing assistance of Afghanistan earlier about uh, uh, 15, 16 years ago, and my friends are suffering. So we have uh, Japan feels that uh, it is important for us to listen and find out how we can assist uh, uh, people in Afghanistan. Uh, female Afghans are very worried about the future and how we can uh, assist them, support them would be very important. Uh, with respect to uh, implications on uh, our coexistence with uh, uh, China, uh, that itself won't uh, give direct impact, but uh, we have to see how China will take its positions. They have already taken their positions, but we have to find out what would be the best for the Afghan people. That's the tone of discussions we have in Tokyo. Dino Jalal, last year you described the world as, a, as being in a hot peace environment. Um, from Jakarta, looking at China's increasing ass assertiveness, do you, would you still characterize the relationship between China and Indonesia as one of hot peace? Uh, no. Uh, look, uh, keep in mind that uh, Indonesia had uh, very bad relations uh, with China. Historically, you know, we froze our relations with China diplomatically in 1965 uh, after the failed coup attempt, which uh, uh, the Suharto government uh, sort of blamed on China, China a little bit, yeah, um, because of the relationship between the Indonesian Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so after decades of uh, no relations, uh, we res resumed relations in 1990. And uh, to be honest, what has happened is uh, uh, China uh, has now become Indonesia's strategic partner. And Indonesia's perspective on China has changed, right? Uh, the Indonesian side uh, believes that uh, China is uh, an asset in our uh, national development. China is the largest trading partner, uh, a major investment uh, source now, largest tourists. Uh, so so the, the weight and the content of the relationship uh, has changed, right? So from Indonesia's perspective, yes, China is the challenge, right? Uh, you know, we always see relationship with the big powers such as the United States and China uh, as, as say, you know, something that uh, a careful embrace right uh, but certainly uh, what how China is seen today by Jakarta is very different than China how China was seen uh, 30 years ago um, there is uh, more strategic trust uh, uh, not perfect right uh, there are some concerns about uh, the influx of Chinese labor uh, into Indonesia, uh, there are concerns about China's uh, claims uh, in in Natuna, right? But the overall picture is that uh, uh, Indonesia sees China as an important partner for our uh, national development and also for 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 regional affairs. So 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 that's how our uh, relationship has changed uh, with China. Justin, talking about changing relationships with China, Australia has found its relationship with China uh, uh, um, unwinding somewhat in, in recent years, as it's uh, really found itself at the leading edge of China's displeasure. I mean, China's imposed tariffs or trade barriers 
on a whole list of Australian goods from barley to wine to lobster to coal. But, you know, despite the rhetoric on decoupling, exports are still growing, albeit with a slower rate of growth. I mean, do you think Australia can continue to sustain a healthy economic relationship with China, even as the political one deteriorates? Louisa, thank you uh, and good morning, colleagues uh, and those dialing into this um, panel discussion. Of course, the potential is there. I think structurally economic complementarity, which has always driven Australia's relations with North Asia, um, the fact that we import what a lot of those economies, including China, produces and we export what they need to consume, particularly energy, and other commodities and inputs into their own processing means that even in the face of disruption, the overall value of exports can grow because it's a fundamental structural coming together of two very complementary economic systems. It's simply a choice of governments whether they want to let market forces and market rules and agreed trade commitments be the thing that dictate the flow of trade the flow of goods, the flow of services, or whether there's something else at play. So while the value of our exports is very robust in some sectors, it's been severely interrupted. And it appears to be the case very clearly that this is um, at a political decision for a political purpose. It's not an easy situation, but it doesn't mean the present has to be the future. Clearly, as the treasurer said yesterday, these measures hurt consumers and businesses in both countries and governments can agree to move on and allow trade to be governed by the fundamental market principles which all WTO members have signed up to. So I'm, I'm neither, I wouldn't say I'm confident or pessimistic, but I think the potential is very clear um, and the success and reliability of Australian supply throughout Asia is something that I don't think will change and can benefit other economies uh, should they choose to avail themselves of those benefits. Back to you. But as someone who is studying China's uh, actions, what do you see as uh, its political and economic trajectory moving forward? Well, I think, um, China itself uh, is obviously, like everyone, grappling with COVID. It's got some important economic questions domestically to resolve, all the long-standing debates about rebalancing its economy. There's obviously some interesting political developments internally. Um, very hard to be clear about the future in a country so, so complicated and in many ways with a political system so opaque but it is going to be a major economy. It is going to grow and it is going to continue to need uh, inputs from the rest of the world. Um, dual circulation, um, which is a, a new policy framework in China. Uh, some of that's about greater self-reliance, but some of it reflects the continuing need for the rest of the world economy. So in that sense, we're an open integrated economy. Uh, the potential is there. And slowly we have to work through these challenges. And I think the government of Australia, as you've seen, uh, isn't going to lurch from one policy position to the other. We want to be steady. We want to be ready for, for um, conversations on no preconditions. And our companies are very competitive, very reliable, and are willing to supply markets wherever they can find them. Michelle, um, if we look at the Sino-US relationship, we've seen these attempts to kind of silo certain areas from the broader relationship to try to protect cooperation. And one area that was supposed uh, to be siloed was climate change, which was described as an, an oasis in China-US relations. But that seems to have run aground with no agreement in recent talks in Tianjin. And China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, even warned, if an oasis is surrounded by desert, sooner or later it becomes desert. I mean, what do you see as the future for these areas of cooperation, given the um, problems and ties? Are we seeing those areas of cooperation becoming uh, increasingly untenable? Look, I, I think both 
China and the US and, and the other, you know, Australia, Indonesia, many other countries have, there's an imperative that we have to work together on climate change or none of us will succeed. Um, I think the same is true for pandemic pre prevention, although, you know, the, the roots of the current pandemic have become such a political hot potato that it's very difficult to sort of take a dispassionate view of lessons learned and how do we do better next time at the moment, but I hope that we'll get there eventually. Um, Nonproliferation is another one. So, you know, these are things where it's in the vital interest of every country um, in the region to deal with these issues and we have to deal with them together to be successful. So I think we will get there. I think what you're seeing right now is, you know, it's, it's a relationship that where the, the two leaders, President Biden and President Xi, really have to meet um, to sort of set the tone going forward. Um, I do think this is going to be a situation of managing competition, keeping competition uh, from going all the way to conflict. No one wants to see an open conflict between two nuclear, arm, nuclear weapon states. Beijing doesn't want that. The US doesn't want that. The only way that happens in my view in the near to midterm is through profound miscalculation. You know, if Beijing were to suddenly believe its own narrative of US decline and think, you know, the US is down and out, they're not getting up, now is our moment. Therefore, we're going to do something stupid and use military force against Taiwan or in the South China Sea or what have you. You could have miscalculations. So I think you know um, the U.S. administration is trying to create a set of facts that show we are going to recover from COVID. Our economy is starting to move and grow. Um, we are investing in the drivers of our competitiveness here at home, we are reinvigorating our allies to stand with us and so forth. But this is gonna be a very challenging, it's, it's going to, managing the competition, finding space, creating space for essential cooperation is very, very complex. But I think it's gonna to have to come from President Xi and President Biden. And right now, frankly, both are very focused on domestic imperatives. Um, and you know, Xi in particular with the run up to the party Congress and the consideration of his third term. I just wanted to um, ask you, you, you were talking about conflict. You think it's unlikely in the, I think you said the near to midterm, but the top US commander in Asia, Admiral Philip Davidson has said China could invade Taiwan within the next six years. I mean, how lightly do you think the risk of a major power conflict over Taiwan is? Well, I do think there's a very real risk of miscalculation um, if we, the United States and our allies, fail to communicate our resolve to say, look, you know, if you chose to resolve this issue by force, the international, that would violate international norms and the international community would respond. Um, you know, we, we consider this to be, you know, uh, an interest worth defending. Um, and then secondly, to demonstrate the capabilities for effective deterrence, either the capabilities to deny the success of any Chinese military aggression or to impose such costs as an international community that it really wouldn't be in their interests. Again, my view is, I don't know how many Star Trek fans are on the, on the, uh, in the conference, but I think China's preferred approach with Taiwan is absorption into the Borg. You know, they, they want to create so much economic independency and so much political overmatch that they just eventually kind of create a a complete more along the Hong Kong model than, you know, invading with, a, you know, a, a large fleet of ships and Marines and aircraft and so forth. Um, doesn't mean it can't happen. Like I said, the, the real risk is miscalculation, misreading each other. And right now, because we're not communicating very well, we don't understand each other very well. We underestimate um, each other in various ways. I think that miscalculation potential is real. And I think that's what, I don't wanna put words in his mouth, but I'm guessing that's what Admiral Davidson was talking about, that risk of miscalculation. And Akiko, from Japan, how does that risk of miscalculation look? Um, it appears the leading candidates to be the next Japanese prime minister both have quite hawkish views on China. They've both endorsed beefing up China, Japan's defenses, 
um, in response to China's dispatch of aircraft and ships around Taiwan and Japan's southern islands. I mean, what, what are we looking at in the next couple of years, do you think? Um, Japan has taken a policy of deterrence and dialogue since 1972 when we signed a joint communique with uh, Beijing to normalize our relations. And I believe we have been very consistent in running both. That it is becoming tough these days to promote both deterrence and dialogue. And as you pointed out, uh, uh, there are more assertive actions by uh, China in East China Sea, which concerns us. And that is the reason why uh, Japan is trying to uh, uh, take more measures, defensive and deterrence measures around the area. Do you know how far uh, Taiwan is from our most uh, Western tip of Japanese archipelago called the Yonakuni Island? Just hundred kilometers. That at least give you some kind of a ring in mind how uh, we are concerned, but Japan will continue to have dialogue and uh, uh, deterrence. China and Japan are neighbors and we have relations over two millennia. And if I look just to the history from uh, 1972 onwards, I would say that there are amicable and tense relations with the zigzag trajectory. But we have made efforts to uh, have uh, uh, friendly uh, ties with our neighbor because we cannot move out. And that is something we will continue to do, but we are going to have this tough challenge of doing both deterrence and dialogue. And of course, um, for uh, things uh, we can uh, collaborate, uh, Japan will continue to push our uh, corporations. And as uh, many of you have already mentioned, global issues such as climate change, pandemic, environmental uh, preservation and others would be a topic that Japan would like to pursue co cooperation with China because on these issues, none of us can act alone in order to grapple with uh, the issues. And in addition, uh, as being a neighbor to China, there are other social issues that we can uh, work on together. For instance, China and Japan are having aging population and population decline. And uh, I personally believe that China and Japan can work together on this issue in building uh, systems and elderly uh, society that elderly can live uh, better. And also we have, we are working together on ocean uh, plastic debris, which uh, are around us. So there are issues of such. However, I also uh, worry about uh, miscalculation or misinterpretation of cost and benefit of uh, uh, conflict by force. And I think it is incumbent on us, all of us, to make the ledger uh, sound enough so that we do not motivate our friend, friend or friends uh, to go uh, for use of force. That's how I perceive the situations today. And that is the reason why we have included peace and stability of Taiwan Strait when uh, Prime Minister Suga met uh, with uh, President Biden and also at the G7 summit held in uh, UK uh, this spring. And this will not, this basic position of dialogue and deterrence will not change, I presume, whether uh, we have, uh, new prime minister who uh, takes, did you say hawkish position? <laughs> uh, that position, because uh, we are placed at the very difficult location which we cannot move out and options are quite limited. Can I just follow up? You talked about making the ledger sound enough so that uh, there's no demotivation. Can you be a bit more explicit about how do you make that ledger sound enough? What does that mean? That's the most difficult challenge, isn't it? Uh, 
China listens and analyzes reactions of uh, international society. And they would know how use of force would cost them in uh, on Taiwan or wherever they would like to. So if we can make ourselves clear how we see use of force by China in this neighborhood, then they would think twice. Let me uh, take the illustration of uh, Mr. Xi Jinping's speech at the study session, uh, was it in June, that he wants to make uh, China lovable or to be uh, loved by others. Listening to that, as well as listening to his speech on BRI a couple of years ago, I sensed a quick shift of tone about uh, BRI. He was aware of that prop argument we are making. So he is listening. And if we can make or suggest cost would be quite expensive for a certain country to use force, then I think it, we, we can make a cost, best, cost benefit analysis uh, more um, sound or helpful in order to prevent miscalculations. That's how I perceive it. Thank you. Um, Dino Jalal, turning to you, how does that cost benefit analysis look when it comes to Indonesia's relationship with China? Um, are there red lines in that relationship? And if so, where are they? Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Louisa. Good question. Uh, first, uh, if Japan's policy is deterrence and dialogue, uh, Indonesia's policy, and I think this is true for, for much of ASEAN countries, if not all ASEAN countries, um, can be described as uh, EBB, right? engage, balance, and benefit. Right? Which means what, uh, and, and this is what we do, not just for China, but for other uh, great powers as well. Uh, we have to engage everybody, you know, in a, and this is very clear in ASEAN's dialogue relationships and Indonesia uh, lists both China and uh, the United States and Japan as a strategic partner, right? So we engage all and we don't want any particular power to dominate uh, the region. Um, because uh, that would be uh, against the notion of uh, ASEAN centrality. Uh, so uh, we, uh, the question is how do we balance uh, their presence and our interaction with all the major powers? This is why Indonesia or ASEAN cannot afford to uh, take sides, uh, to choose uh, and uh, one side against another, right? So, so it's very important to understand. And lastly, uh, definitely, we need to uh, benefit from from these relationships. Uh, you asked about China. Uh, in, you know the figures that the Indonesians understand are enormous. Uh, you know, five ten trillion dollars of export of imports into, uh, from China. You know, that's a lot of export for us. Uh, five hundred billion dollar of investments, uh, potential investments, and about five hundred million tourists uh, coming from China that uh, we want to attract to. Southeast Asia and Indonesia, right? So uh, I think for us, the name of the game is, is uh, engage, uh, balance, uh, and 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 benefit. Now, um, the red line obviously is uh, uh, for China and for anybody. For, this is true for Indonesia. It's a uh, political intervention, right? Um, and uh, you know, the, every every election time, Indonesians always uh, wonder what foreign powers are. Playing or intervening or have a you know uh, have a design on Indonesian elections. You know this is the public view. There's a lot of conspiracy theories and 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 and, and so on. And and on some elections, uh, the U.S. has always been the popular, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not not popular, but but in a pu public imagination, they were saying is uh, the U.S. who they who do they choose and 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 so on and so on. Uh, so far, uh, we don't see uh, China uh, intervening. Uh, in, in our elections. Uh, China has been very uh, careful to show that uh, they have a totally hands-off uh, uh, position uh, on, on our domestic politics. Uh, and the other thing is really strategic autonomy, Louisa. Indonesians are not just independent, but they're very proud uh, and very 
uh, jealous of uh, our ability and capacity to make strategic decisions. Um, and, you know, it's becoming challenging uh, because when you have a, a country that is uh, so economically connected to Indonesia now and that, that economic influence will grow for sure uh, relative to the U.S. economic uh, uh, engagement with Indonesia, right? Uh, I mean, right now, our trade with China is three times more our trade with the United States, which is a lot, right? Uh, so uh, our, our, the big question is, uh, uh, despite this uh, very close uh, uh, economic engagement and that are bound to be rising, how uh, do we maintain our strategic uh, uh, autonomy? Right? Uh, and I'm sure we can uh, do that. But on, on tactical level, that, that questions comes up again and again. And I mean, to what extent is Indonesia looking at the example of Australia as a kind of cautionary tale? <laughs> it's a good question. You know, I talk to my Australian friends all the time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they they told us this. They told us, look, we we gave that uh, benefit of the doubt to China. You know, we, we extended uh, goodwill and, and cooperation with China and it went fine for a while, but uh, look at what happens now, you know, uh, and you know very well with the, the cases that I'm, I'm talking about, right? Uh, so they're saying, you know, it might happen to you, right? Uh, and to be, to be, question, to be honest, uh, this is the questions that Indonesians are, are asking, right? Uh, two important questions. Uh, and not necessarily have uh, great answers. One is what happens when you get too close to China, right? I think this is a strategic question that everybody has to ask, right? What happens when you get too close to China? Different countries have different answers to this. Secondly, what happens when you disagree with China, right? Uh, again, different countries will have different answers uh, to this because China behaves differently, uh, differently to countries that disagree with it, you know? Uh, you know, Fiji gets away with it, right? Uh, but the Philippines during the Arroyo time uh, got different answers and, and so on. So, so, you know, those questions are being asked. Right? But the thing with China, I think, look, uh, it's, it's one of these relationships where uh, you want to get close to China, but you need to stand up when, when you need to. And what China respects, uh, in my view, right? Uh, sorry, uh, let me rephrase it. Uh, when you push back in China and stand firm on your ground, that's how you get China's respect, right? That's how China doesn't push you around, you know? Uh, under Natuna, for example, uh, you know, there were, there were things that China said about their claim, the nine dash line uh, being overlapping with our jurisdictional waters in uh, North Natuna sea waters, right? But, you know, uh, President Jokowi uh, took a boat there, uh, uh, did, uh, cabinet meeting in, in a warship and, and so on. And, you know, basically he said, look, you know, don't, don't, don't touch us on this. Don't, don't mess around with this, you know. Uh, and uh, the tone from Beijing changed uh, afterwards, right? Uh, if President Jokowi had not done that, uh, probably, you know, it's like uh, drawing sand on, on, on drawing line on the sand, you know, if you draw one line and nobody does anything, then you erase that line and then you make a, bigger line until until somebody pushes back right so the ability to the, the art of diplomacy for china is really how to do those ebb uh, the, the engage the balance and benefit but uh, at the same time uh, you know standing uh, strong uh, uh, firm on on issues that you need to uh, and and not not fear the consequences so justin when it comes to uh Australia's position. I mean, I'm just wondering how you see the kind of next steps for Australia. I mean, we're talking about models of coexistence and cooperation, but it seems like, you know, the bilateral relationship is, is Australia's frozen out. <laughs> There's almost nothing going on. How can you coexist and cooperate when you're in the deep freeze? I mean, what, what happens next? Louisa, thank you. Look, I think one of the interesting things about this conversation is that it's very hubs and spokes kind of conversation, China in the centre and everybody's bilateral relationship one by one. And I think what strikes me about the comments of um, my fellow panellists and, and Dr Jai Shanker's speech last night is that it's, it's really about all regional countries 
acting together to respond to this particular very new unprecedented phenomenon of a major power that's developed very fast, uh, very impressively. Uh, it has a, a system that is different to the system of almost all of its neighbours um, and the other key regional actors, especially the United States. We get a say, we have agency in the way the region develops and the rules, norms and institutions that underpin engagement between states, that facilitate trade, that govern the maritime domain and other things. And so, you know, when you say what next for Australia, we've been engaged in an intensive, although COVID constrained regional uh, engagement. Uh, we've deepened our ties with ASEAN. Our relationship with India, as Dr. Jai Shankar said yesterday, has been the most impressive of all the quad bilateral linkages to develop. Um, I don't think we could be closer with our Japanese colleagues and friends uh, than we could be at the moment. You know, we're literally taking forward the relationship and we're open across the board to engage with all partners because how the region develops, how the region accounts for and coexists with China is absolutely fundamental to us. So when you say what next, uh, it's very hard to predict the future, but what we do know is that we will be active and have agency and work in partnership to try and address this challenge. When you are a smaller country dealing with a big power, doesn't matter how well-intentioned or otherwise that big power is, it doesn't work. Regionalism though, or networked partnership or alliances, they give you something different. Um, and that is the reality we're talking about. Not China on its own with one or two individual countries, but China on its own with some regional organizations, China in a network of alliances. How do we work together to fashion a future that's stable some of this will be hard to know until the world truly re reconnects post-COVID. And China, of course, um, is a little isolated in that sense, very strict border controls. We have them in Australia as well. Um, there's the wash up of Afghanistan, but the, the issue for us, what next is working with as many partners as possible to ensure we maintain peace, stability, there is no one dominant power and that trade, travel, all these things take place according to internationally agreed rules. And it's very important if you're a middle-sized or a small country that the big players, whoever they are, stick to their commitments uh, and are bound by the obligations they've undertaken. So, I mean, you talk about acting together and about sort of regionalism or network partnerships or alliances, but do you think that sort of the architecture of the region allows for acting together in a way that can counter China? Because I think you do make a really good point about the hubs and spokes. Does this different reality that we're in require sort of different um, forms or bodies to allow that kind of acting together to happen? It sort of hardly needs saying to a panel so distinguished, but Asia is is too diverse, too broad and too big to have kind of architecture like NATO formal stuff. This is where partnerships like the Quad or trilateral um, partnerships such as the one between Australia, France and India come, come into play. I mean, this is about... Um, you know, it's less about traditional structures. It's more about cooperating on issues, coalitions, flexible balancing, all of the things actually that Dr. Jayashankar was talking about last night. We, we're not going to institutionalize a structure and build new um, elaborate regional security entities. We've already got ASEAN, we work with it and we respect its role and its convening power and its centrality. Um, but we need many tools, not just one. Um, and that just reflects the reality of different perspectives, different interests, and the sheer diversity of views in this particular part of the world. And it also reflects that we have a country like the United States that is fundamental to the region in terms of 
its economic development in, in terms of investment, technology, supply chains, and then in its security dimensions, well, you know, there is no structure that can be built with the United States in mind that, that, that's sort of truly pan-regional. It's just not viable. But we do have, for example, in the Quad, an ability to function together on issues when they matter, when interests align, but it's light touch, um, it's based on issues, and it's around a common view of how to work with a region that allows ASEAN to be central and all powers to develop peacefully and in a stable fashion. Um, so just before we open for Q&A, um, you know, we, this has been such an interesting discussion, um, although quite gloomy in many respects. I, I, maybe we could end on a slightly more positive note. Are there any bright spots in, in the relationship with China that, that uh, are worth, uh, that, that, I, that can sort of be drawn upon in this conversation about coexistence with China? Uh, maybe, Michelle, let's start with you. You know, I, I do think that we need to be clear with China about sort of how we envision going forward. I, I think it was unfortunate that the Trump administration sort of started talking about decoupling as a strategy or as a policy, because the truth is all of us have economies that are very integrated with China. All of us will have important trade relationships with China going forward. Um, so decoupling is neither possible nor advisable or desirable, um, even from a US perspective, economic perspective. What we need to do it's, you know, is not take a sledgehammer to the economic relationship. We need to use a scalpel and carve out you know, where do we need to protect supply chains that are directly relevant to national security. Uh, directly relevant to public health um, or directly relevant to a particular technology area where we really feel we need to maintain competitive advantage. If you take all of those things together, it's not insignificant, but it doesn't blow up the entire relationship. You know, we still have, we'll have very robust and healthy and mutually beneficial trading relationships with China. And so I think it's very important to start to sort of countering, count, start countering the assumption that we're headed towards some kind of new Cold War, which I think is a terrible frame for what things should be like and will be like with China going forward. And to be a little bit more nuanced in talking about where do we envision continued trade and mutually beneficial inter engagement and interaction, and where do we see competition, but competition that we're gonna manage very carefully to avoid um, conflict. And that, I, so I, I think we need to do a better job of really fleshing out what does that look like? Um, because right now, I think everybody, you know, both, both China and some in the US, particularly on Capitol Hill, are thinking about absolute worst case scenarios that I think we should be working very hard to avoid. Thank you so much. Uh, it seems that we have reached the end of our time. Um, it's just been such a wide ranging and thought provoking discussion. I'd really like to thank um, fantastic questions from the audience. And of course, the wealth of experience that such a distinguished panel brings to this discussion. So thank you to Michelle Flournoy, Dino Jalal, Justin Hayhurst and Akiko Fukushima. And thank you so much, Richard, for organizing this and for the team behind the scenes who made this all possible in Zoom land. So thank you all very much uh, for sticking around as well. I noticed that all our part, we've had so many audience members that have continued all the way through to listen to this. I know everybody has Zoom fatigue. So um, I'm really pleased to see so many people have stayed the course. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Louisa, thank you, Akiko. Justin, thank you. Michelle, thank you very much. Thank you very much.